All right, good morning. In the interest of starting on time, we will start on time. Good morning. morning. Hope everyone's having a good Friday. If this is too loud or feedback, maybe just let me know and I can adjust a little bit. All right. So, um, welcome to Google Palooza Part 4 in the ongoing series of getting everyone excited about using Google Apps in some capacity. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Scott Baker. I'm the Vice President for Information Technology. So I don't see anybody that might not be aware of that, but if so, that's me. Um, so what I've been trying to do over the last several years since the college started using all the Google apps is to just give people um, a, a top-level overview of all the different Google apps. And then if you see it, it's some part of the Google apps that you think, hey, I can really leverage this in my uh, job here at the college then I'm welcome, I'm glad to meet with you one-on-one and sit down and really hash things out. Um, I've done a couple of in-depth kind of deep, deep dives on some of the specific apps before, but it seems more productive that I kind of show you an overview of things, and then you can look at uh, how you might be able to use it more. So if you've been to one of these before, we may cover some things that you've already seen before, uh, but I'll also try to show you some things that I've discovered or come across since the last time I've done one of these. So there'll be, there'll be some things that I've covered before that we'll talk about, um, but there'll also be some new things that, um, that I'll try to talk about. And any question if you have, a, or any point in time you have a question, or hey, here's, how can I do this, or hey, I do this, this is pretty cool, please share it, because I want this to be a collaborative workshop. It's not just me up here spewing things to you, but I want you all to, uh, to be part of the experience. So without further ado, we will get things started. So I used the, for those of you, there are 14 of the people that signed up that filled out the Google form. And when we get to Google Forms, I'll show you how I get this data. But I went in and looked at the survey results of who wants to know what um, as part of this workshop. So most people wanted to know how to use Google Forms. Um, and then the rest were split between Google Drive, Google Hangouts, and some of the others. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cover all of these. I'm actually going to start with Google Drive because I want everyone to feel comfortable kind of with an overview of how it works. And then we'll jump in and we'll do, i arrange them in the order of popularity from the survey. Okay. So let's just talk a bit about Google Drive. If you're familiar with Google Drive, this will be a little bit of a rehash, but I'll also like to reiterate how it works. Um, I've got a brief video on some of these that I'm going to share um, that'll, that are, are show a nice overview, but then we'll talk about them as well. Amy and John work together at a travel agency. Amy edits the newsletter, and John does all the hard work traveling the globe reviewing vacation destinations. When John is on the road, he emails photos and documents to Amy and sends more email when he changes one of his reviews or takes a better picture. Unfortunately, all those emails and file attachments add up to a lot of confusion. Amy just has too much to do to keep track of which version is the latest. Google Drive helps with this back and forth by making sharing easy. Because you can store any type of file in Drive and share any file with anyone. Documents, presentations, photos, anything. And you can do even more with the documents, presentations, and spreadsheets that you create in Drive by giving different access rights to the people you share your documents with. From being able to view a file, to being able to make changes to it and share it with new people. So when Amy needs to show the newsletter to her boss, Catherine, she shares the document with just a few clicks. Giving Catherine the ability to comment and giving John viewing access so he can follow along. With Drive, the whole team always works on the same file, no matter how many edits get made. Letting everyone keep on top of last minute changes from anywhere. For more information on sharing files with Google Drive, visit the Help Center. All right, so that's a, a nice overview of kind of the big picture of what Google Drive does. What I really like about Google Drive is that it has um, a couple of big advantages for us here at the college. One is for any type of documents, whether it be a Google Doc or a Google Sheet or anything along those lines, it allows us to do 
real-time collaboration so we can have multiple people in the same file at the same time. If you've ever had that situation where someone emails out a Word file or an Excel spreadsheet, then once everybody edited it and emailed it around or it's on the W drive and Kurt goes to edit it, but I'm in it, so he's locked out and he can't do it. So if you've ever come across those sort of things and they're frustrating, uh, Google Drive is a really good solution to be able to do that sort of collaboration. It also allows you to share um, some files a little bit easier. That is a double-edged sword that we'll talk a little bit about. It's good that everybody can share anything, but it's also very dangerous that everybody can share everything. So we'll talk about some of the things with that. So just as an overview, what is Google Drive? I'm not going to read everything that's on this slide. But basically what's cool about it is, is Google Drive, if you think of it, is, it's, it's basically cloud storage for all of your files. But you can also install the Google app for your desktop, whether it be a PC or a Mac. And then what it does is it, it also creates a Google Drive folder on your computer. The beauty of it is, is it keeps those two synced up as long as you're connected to the internet. So if Annette goes in on her computer and just browses to her Google, Google Drive folder and edits a file there, and then she gets home, oh, I need to do something on that. She can then go onto her computer at home, go into the Google Drive, she can log into her Gmail account and go to Google Drive on the web interface and edit the same file. Now the caveat with that is that if you're using Microsoft Office files like a Word document or Excel, you can still store those in Google Drive, but your editing capability using the web interface might be a little bit limited. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So for me, probably 95% of all the files that I do are Microsoft Office format. Okay? Probably about 5% of them are Google Docs format. The ones that I do in Google Docs are typically the ones that I always want to have available that I can edit, and ones that I need to be able to share and collaborate with people. But the rest of the files, I just want them on Google Drive so I can really get to them anywhere. Um, but I also want them backed up. Okay? So I think of Google Drive is kind of like your P drive on steroids. Okay? To get to your P drive, as all of you know, if you're not at work, all you have to do. You've got to probably connect to a remote desktop connection if you have it, kind of log into the, the Windows remotely to get to your P drive files. You can't just pick up a device and, and look at those files. But with Google Drive, that gives you the ability to go in on your uh, portable device or a computer from anywhere you have internet connection, log in and get to it. So does that make sense, kind of how Google Drive works? Stores in the cloud that syncs with all of your devices. I have, a, I have a pretty picture in here in a minute that shows that, how that works. I talked about synchronization and how it works. So if you think of it this way, kind of how this graphic is, uh, Google Drive keeps things shared with all of your devices. So it's agnostic. It doesn't care if it's Mac or PC. Um, so it, it plays well with others. Works on Android devices, works with iOS devices. I'm assuming it works with Windows phones and Blackberries, but they're like 0.00001% of the market. So for, for statistical purposes, uh, Jonathan, we can just factor those out at this point. And if you don't have a smartphone, you're SOL on anything that has a, any of these others. So in case anyone in the room doesn't have a smartphone. Um, one cool thing about Google Drive is that we used to have a, a limitation of 25 gigabytes of how much you could store on it. But Google Apps for Education now is unlimited for the storage. So um, you can store as much as you want. I think I have like 52 gigabytes on my Google Drive, uh, which is nice. Um, if you do the synchronization piece, if you just install Google Apps on each of your computers, it's going to sync those up. So I would encourage you, like at home, probably not to install Google Apps to sync with your work stuff. But for your work computer, that's fine. But just know that amount of space will be taken up on each of your computers. On your mobile devices, it doesn't ever actually download the files unless you tell it to sync offline and it'll, it'll download those. But you basically have unlimited space, just like you do on the P drive. You technically have unlimited space, even though it is finite. We try not to make you get it all bloated, but we do have a lot of storage space on there. One of the big questions that people have is how safe is my data that's on Google Drive? Is it encrypted? Um, all the Google Drive data is encrypted between your computer and all the Google servers, and also um, here at the college, um, everything's behind a firewall. Um, with that said, your data is only as secure as whatever your password is for your SEC account. Fortunately, we require you to do um, some password maintenance, we have some minimum standards on that. But no, for your, for your mobile devices, I have Google Drive installed on my phone. To get to my Google Drive, once I'm on my phone, I just click on the Google Drive icon and I'm in. So the security on my portable device is whatever my passcode is or my fingerprint on my phone. If you don't have 
any security set up on your mobile device. Do not, please do not install Google Drive and sync it with the college information because then you're risking creating a, a weak link for someone that they took your device to get into all of your Google Drive files. So does that make sense? So it's only secure as you make it for your portable devices. But as the uh, information flows back and forth on Google Drive, no one's going to be able to get to it. How can I share information with people and have them share with me? Uh, we've got our Google Drive set up that it allows you to share both with people within SCC, but also people that are not SCC. Some institutions lock that down and don't ever let you share anything with Google Drive outside of the college domain. Um, we haven't had anyone abuse that as of yet, so we haven't had to lock that down. But it is a potential security um, challenge. So it's one where Peter could basically set a folder with all the student data and accidentally share it with someone outside the college or with the college uh, that doesn't need to get access to it. So I just did that. Okay, well, <laughs> please undo that, Peter, if you did do it. Um, and, in the name of all things, please don't do that. Um, so um, right now we allow that to happen for non-SEC users. Probably the health sciences folks and some of their clinical things that need to to, to, to get some data back and forth are probably the bigger users um, of that. Um, but, um, but they also know the, the HIPAA requirements for what you can share and what you can't share. And we'll go through how to do some of these things when we look at Google Drive. Is there a question? Okay. So let's look at Google Drive, and this is just going to be a, a, a basic overview of it. When you log into your SCC account, and this is my Gmail interface, and this is how I get to it. Up in the top right-hand corner, you're going to see nine little dots. If you click on those dots, those list all of the Google apps that we have activated for the college. One of those is Google Drive. When you click on Google Drive, it'll open, hopefully, in a different tab on your browser. And you'll see how you have your Google Drive organized. So, basically, I have mine set up with a bunch of folders and some files within those. Okay? Also on this computer, I have the Google Drive app installed. So if I click on the app, which is the, which is the little icon here on my dock, and it opens up, notice my file structure here on the web interface. I've got academic awards, advising, articulation agreements. If I go into the Google Drive app, notice my folders are academic awards, advising, articulation agreements. So it's syncing those two together. This folder here is on my computer. This set of folder and drive here is on the web. Does that make sense? So you can see that they're talking to each other. As long as my computer's connected to the internet, my little Google Drive icon up here will swirl and show me that it's mixing up the magic stew that syncs up the what's on the cloud and what's on the, on the computer. Does everybody feel good about that? Okay. Some of you are like, Scott, I've heard you say this 50 times. This me well, I think that's like one of the most confusing things for people. Mm -hmm. Is it on my computer or is it in the right. cloud? Yeah, the you're right. People ask, is it, is it, where is it stored? The answer is yes. Yeah. It's stored. At a minimum, at a minimum, it's on Google Drive in the cloud. But the moment you install Google Apps on your desktop computer and then log into it using your SCC credentials, then that computer, it'll start downloading and syncing it to that local device. Okay? Same thing with your phone. And yes? Only if you have the Google App on your device. Right? Correct. You have to install the Google Drive app. To, and the next question is, well, how do I get this Google Drive app that you speak of so highly? Um, in the Google Drive web interface, up on the top right-hand corner, there's a little cog up there. If I click on it, it gives me the download drive option. And then it'll walk you through the steps to download the drive executable file. You'll run it, and it'll install, and then it'll ask you for your uh, Google credentials. And you'll just log into it, just like you would into your Gmail. You'll put in your SEC username and password to get to it. Okay? I have a question, Yes, Tyler. Um, can you tell the app what aspects of your device you want it to back up? So the question is on the app, on the mobile device, can you tell it which ones you want it to back up and which you don't? Um, on, the, on your mobile device, it's not backing up everything that's on your mobile device. Okay. It's simply creating the Google Drive file structure and folders. So you're just getting to the files that are on there, but it's not backing up like your photos that are on your phone, unless you're using Google Photos, then it does it a little bit different way. And what if I have it synced to my PC? If you have it synced to your PC, it's only syncing the files that are in that Google Drive folder. Does that make sense? So for example, uh, and this would be like what would be Windows Explorer, or, uh, 
you know, Windows Explorer, I'm in, in Finder on the Mac. So over here on my left hand side, I can see I've got my desktop, my documents, everything else. And I have a, file, a folder called Google Drive. So it's, a, it's its own file structure on the computer. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, that's a good question. So once you download the, the Drive app, you can install it. And depending on how much it is, you can see down here on the Google Drive web interface how much space you have. How much you have on there will determine how long that first synchronization will take. So in this case, this will probably take mine a couple hours to get that done. But if you don't have that much, it does it pretty quickly. And then it just looks. Every time you edit a file and save it and close it, it keeps looking. The Google Drive app keeps looking in there. And as soon as it says you're done with that, I'm syncing it to the web. So it's pretty nice. And it keeps that going. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So that's the Google Drive overview. Anything I didn't cover? Anyone that's my, my Google Drive gurus? Kirk? Everything? Okay. So the most... Uh, yes? Sorry, how can I tell if I have already have Google Drive on my laptop? Um, the, the, the laptops that are in here, I know, don't have Google Drive installed on them. But if you're curious, if you did, on Windows, you can just go to the programs list, go to like all programs, and you should see Google Drive as one of the ones listed there. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yep. And then what you'll see... And, yeah, and look for the yeah, look for the Google Drive logo, which is this one down here, the little green, yellow, and blue triangle. Yeah, on a PC, it'll be in the bottom right hand corner, and, and that will be what swirls and sinks. But it may be hidden on yours. Sometimes those those system tray icons will be hidden on a Mac. It's up here at the top in the little uh, app list across the top. Okay. So next, let's talk about Google Forms and what Google Forms does. Google Forms is probably one of the coolest um, apps that they have, and they updated it back in 2015 to make it a lot more powerful and do a lot of things um, that are very useful. Um, what Google Forms allows you to do is to be able to create everything from, from surveys to any piece of data that you want to collect um, from folks, and then you can send it to them either in an email as a link and it goes to a web page that has the Google Form on it or all of the above. So you've probably at the college in some capacity gotten a Google form um, that you filled out. For this class, for example, at RSVP, um, there was a Google form that uh, let you fill that out. Uh, the nice part about it too is you can embed Google forms on web pages. So if you have a web page here at the college, and either you, you may not have editing rights, but we can help you um, get it set up. You can actually embed a Google form on a web page. So if you need someone to go to it and have it available temporarily or long term, to fill something out, you can do that as well. That's probably the least popular way that it's used. Most folks just like to email a link or put a link available on a web page to go to the form. Those all work. It just kind of is all you know, how, how you want it to look. So let's look at Google Forms and how that works. For example, I'm going to show you kind of the end result of what I got. Then we'll go back to creating one. So I'll show, I'll show you how useful it is. So for this particular top session, um, 14 people filled out the survey that says, what do you want me to cover in this training session? So the cool part about it is now I go into this form and I'm gonna go over to the questions tab. Here's how it looked when you filled it out, okay? And then what I have as the owner of this is I have a tab called responses. And I can see that 14 people filled this thing out. And depending on your question types and how you collect it, you can see an aggregate of the data that's on here. Okay? Some of it may do it in pie charts and some of it may do it in, in, in graphs like this, depending on what question type you have and how you have the responses set up. I can also see in the comments that um, some folks said they'd like to um, have their calendar reflect their part-time schedule so colleagues can see it, so we'll cover that in the calendars. And the Google Drive would like to be a modified shared document without destroying the original. So it's pretty cool that you can collect that data. And when I look at it this way, it's not going in and telling me who responded to what. I could go into individual responses and see who, who did what. If I'm collecting that data, um, I can see those responses. Okay? One other cool thing is that if you see this little green icon, that's the Google Sheet. If I click on that, that creates a Google Sheet in the same directory or folder where I've got my Google Form. And it lets me have it like an, the online Excel version of Google Sheets of all this collection of data. So it's pretty sweet to do that. Once you don't want to accept responses anymore, like for this workshop, 
I could turn it off and say, hey, no, nobody else can, can submit anything um, for the workshop here. Okay, so now let's back up to creating a Google form and kind of what we do with it. So now that you have familiarity with Google Drive, we have to say, where do we want to create our Google form? Okay, please don't be the Wild West where you put everything in the top level directory and just have everything there. Okay, it's just like, to me, it's the equivalent of opening up your closet, taking a handful of papers and just throwing them in the closet and shutting the door and like, I'll find those later. Okay, organize it out of the gate and your life will be much happier down the line. So, so what I've done is I've got a folder in my top level of my Google Drive called Google Apps Presentation. Inside of it, I've got a folder for each of my Google, Google Paloozas I did. So I'm going to Google Palooza Part 4. And notice I'm in the web interface for Google Drive. I'm going to go up here and go to New. And it's asking me what I want to create new. Notice it's not giving me Google Forms as one of the choices. So I'm going to go over here to More and it gives me some extra things. So I'm gonna pick Google Forms. And it's gonna create that Google Form in that directory where I had browsed to in my Google Drive web interface. Okay, at this point, you're ready to go. So you have a couple of choices here. You can create the form from scratch, or you can use some of the templates um, that they have uh, built into um, to Google Drive or to uh, Google Forms. So um, you can do it either way. I generally create mine from scratch just because I like to do that, but you can go in and create them using some of their templates. So let's just do it from scratch because I think that's probably how most of you are going to do this. At a minimum, you want to put in what your form is. So I'm going to call this one my test form. Uh, you can go in and put a form description if you want to. You don't have to. Um, Let's say I got a phone call and something happened and I need and I close out of here. When I exit out, I have this new untitled form that's in there. Okay, that's why I encourage you to name all of your forms right out of the gate. Uh, so I'm going to open this one back up, and when I click up there to rename it, by default, what it's going to do is it's going to grab this name from here and stick it up there. Okay, which is useful. It used to not do that, and I think. Enough users said, hey, why is it called Untitled all the time? So let's actually give it a name. So now you want to go in and start creating your questions for your form. By default, it just gives you the a default um, format for adding radio button questions. Radio button questions only allow you to choose one response. Checkbox questions allow you to choose multiple responses and so on and so forth. But the cool part about it is... For each of my questions, I can go in and choose what type of question I want it to be. So if you want to give people a pick list, you can choose drop down and then you just type in each of your responses. And I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm hitting tab, tab, I'm just pasting, I'm being lazy. Okay. And then I have my four responses that will be in a drop-down list. If you want to see how that question looks, you can click on the little eyeball that's up here and preview it. And I can see for this question, it gives me a drop-down list of the responses. Okay. I'll close out of the preview mode and get back to my question. If you want to add more questions, you just go down. And let me number these so it's not so ambiguous. I can click on the little plus that's over here on the right to add a question and I can keep on going down the line, okay? If, if you don't like the order of how these are appearing, you can drag the little dots and rearrange these. So if I want this one to be at the top, I can do that. I can go down here to the bottom and um, show some different things based on the different questions. You can do some shuffling. Um, you can duplicate an existing question if you want to do one that's very similar um, and things of that nature. If I want to delete this question, I hit delete. So if I have a question too that's going to be just like this, but I'm going to change it a little bit, I can click on the duplicate option and then I can just change how I want things to be. And let's say instead of a drop down, I want this one to be multiple choice. It'll just change the format. Okay. So does that make sense? Yes. Um, it seems like sometimes if you look at the review, it actually adds a response. If you are... If I'm creating a survey and then I go up there to see what it looks like, Okay. 
Okay. And it adds a response. Yeah, it's because that last one that's got another, the last. Oh, it looks, looks like another. other. Yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes it may do that, if you do, especially if you don't put more than one response, it may use that other um, as an example. So like, here's this add option or add other. If I click on that, it'll put it in there as an option. But if it's putting one that you don't like, you can just click on the little X over here. But it shouldn't, shouldn't put it in there in general until you tell it to. Yeah, I, I mean, it puts it in there. But no, when I go to look at the survey, mm -hmm. and um, it seems like it, it would say, you know, what response now even though nobody has responded to the survey yet. Oh, I got you. Yeah. yeah, so oh, here are the responses here. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, if you actually go in and preview it, mm -hmm. and then you answer questions and submit, oh, okay. it'll, it'll say, oh, you've got a response. Okay. Yeah, so that's what it is. And then what you can do is you can just go into responses and delete the responses or clear them out. You, you can go in here and um, right next to the little Google Sheet, use this set of dots and do delete all responses. Great. Okay. Now, the warn a word of warning is when you do that, if there are any actually any responses, it's going to delete them all um, on that as well. Okay? You can put in cool stuff um, in the different questions. You have over here, you can go in and create sections for your uh, forms. You can go in and add pictures. You can add Google uh, YouTube videos, which is pretty cool, um, and different things. So I would encourage you just to play with it and see. At the top level of the Google Forms, which I, when I do that back arrow, it takes me to my Google Forms homepage. It'll give you a bunch of templates that are in here, which are pretty cool. Um, so that if you say, hey, I need to do something and I, I don't want to have to create it all from scratch, you can go into this template gallery. And that's for the college. And you can see some of the ones that they've got built already um, for it. So let's say you have an event feedback that you want. I can just click on that template and then at least fills a bunch of this stuff in for me then I can then go in and change. So you can play with some of the templates and see if they would be to your advantage um, to go in and, uh, and tweak. Kind of missed how you got to the template. Okay, so when I'm in, so I'm in my form because I created a form from Google Drive but when I click this back arrow here it takes me to what's called the forms home page. So it's still in my Google Drive, and then this is where the template gallery is, okay? And in the template gallery, there's actually one for the college. So if you create a template that's really cool, you can add it to the SEC template gallery and people can see it. So no one's done that and I've not done it, so there are none that are in there. Um, but there is a way to do that as well. At least that's what they say. We don't, we don't have any proof to that yet. <laughs> so that's how you get to the template gallery that's in there, okay? And then it'll show you your recent forms that you have um, as well. Does everybody feel good on, on Google Forms? Okay, I encourage you just to play with it. If you get stuck on anything, just let me know. I'm glad. Uh, yeah, I have yeah. a question, sorry. Yes. Is there a limit to the responses you can get? There's no limit to the number of responses you can get. Really? And um, you can send it to people within the college or outside? Correct. Okay. Yep. You can send the form to anyone inside or outside the college. You can also... Um, I'll just show you. Now, I'm gonna, everyone's going to see who responded on these, but I'm going to show you how it works. So you can also share the responses in a couple different ways. The easiest way is to probably, I'm in my form, in this particular form, I can go to the create a spreadsheet for it, and I'm going to create a new spreadsheet that's going to have the same name as the form. And it's going to take all the responses from the survey and put them in a Google Sheet. So I can go in and see who has submitted what, and I could actually share this with other people if I wanted to. So that's what I had Bethany do on the signups for this, is to share with me the responses for her master signup sheet. We filtered it by the Google Palooza Part 4, and then I can see everyone that has signed up for it. Okay? So I know. That way, when I want to send you guys some stuff after the fact, unless you RSVP for this session, you're not going to get my stuff back, okay? So I'm only going to send it to the people that have RSVP'd on this list. Um, so that's how um, you can get to results from the forms as well, other than just the responses area. Okay? All right, so let's move on. The next one is Hangouts. Um, a couple of you asked about Hangouts and how it works. Uh, Google Hangouts is probably the least professional name of something that could have some really cool professional uses that are on there. 
Um, but it's basically the Google's version of Skype. Um, but it has a lot of more cool things that you can do with it because it integrates with Google Apps. So I'm going to just give you an overview of this. I don't have anybody set up to do a live video conference or anything. But what you can do is it's a meeting and collaboration tool that lets you um, set up basically, um, you've all done webinars, right? Where you log in remotely and then you have a set of people. So Google Hangouts lets you do that. You can do it with video and or just audio if you want to. Um, you can share screens so you can be doing a presentation and share that with someone's uh, with the other people that are in the hangout you can give them control so if we're all in one i can give kirk control of my of the of the hangout and we can see what's on his screen while he talks um, you can share youtube videos which is pretty cool and the neat thing about it is it doesn't stream the youtube video from my computer to everyone else what it does is it actually loads youtube on everybody's computer remotely and then they just watch the video all in sync at the same time which is pretty cool um, so everyone at the college we have your own um, a Google Hangout, so to speak. Um, you can do some live stuff with it, too. I've had a couple people ask me about that. Um, you can get to Hangouts a couple different ways. The easiest way is to go to hangouts.google.com. You just log in with your SEC credentials if it doesn't already. And then you'll basically be in the Hangouts web application. Now, Hangouts also um, replaced the old Google Chat um, that used to exist. And the way it works... And I still use the old version of this, but over in my email, over on the right-hand side, this is actually how Google Hangouts works, is I have this basically like an instant message window for folks at the college. So most people um, are logged into, when they're logged into their Gmail, have the, the Google Hangouts enabled so that you can message. But I can go in and Kirk, and we can say, and we can just message back and forth. So that's very convenient if you like to message with people. It's more real time than doing emails back and forth. So it's just a level of convenience. If you don't want to be bothered, you can go up here and change your status to invisible, busy, custom message, whatever. So I can see on my list all the people that are green lights. So I can see Erin is in the back, but she's not got her green light on, which means she's saying, I'm available if you want to contact me, please. If they, if they have their little red light on, that means I'm logged in, but please leave me alone for the time being. Okay. And then the, the ones that are orange or amber are people who are logged in, but they've stepped away from the computer and they're, they're, they're available but not logged in at the moment. And then at the bottom is people who just simply aren't logged in. Okay? And I'll show you in Gmail how to turn to configure it like this if you want to. By default, it puts that chat window down at the bottom of the labels, which I don't like. Okay? So, again, you can go to Hangouts. Uh, Google.com, and I'm already logged into it, and at this point, it shows me my chat window um, over on the left, and then I can start a video call, a phone call, I can start chatting, and then, I, then my menus over here give me all kinds of sharing options that I can do with that. Question, yes? Mm -hmm. Is there any concern for our students' levels of security if they're on Google Hangouts? Is you know, anybody else, somebody else hacking in? No, because the Google Hangout, if you think about it, it's like so you're creating a virtual meeting room and you're in control of it. So you control who is allowed to be in there. Now, if they, if they do one themselves and then connect to someone they don't know, um, you know, then the question is, are they secure when they're in Google Hangouts? Uh, we can't control that part, but when you create the Google Hangout, you're creating the, basically the virtual room, and you're allowing people to come into it. You can send them an invite. Um, if I click on video call and I create this Google Hangout, I can name it and I can invite people to it. So I'm controlling access to it. I can send people a link to my room so I could post that in my Blackboard course or in my classroom. And then that's how people get to me. During my office hours, I'm going to be logged in Google Hangouts. Hit me up if you want to. And you give the students that link. So you're controlling access to it. So the question being, is it secure? Is it as secure as you, as you make it, which should be by default pretty secure because you're controlling access to it. Mm-hmm.
Um, as long as they log in, then they're putting in their credentials. If they don't log out when the next person uses it, then that could be an issue, but that's more user security than general security itself. So if they're using portable devices, uh, that's one of the beauties of, of, of Google Hangouts is um, you know folks can use their portable devices to do it. Um, so as long as they log out or the person before them logs out, then you know I could be, if you didn't log out and then I picked it up, I could be acting as you, so to speak. I guess until, unless we're doing a video chat, then you're like, well, that's obviously not who I think it is, sort of thing. So that should work. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I love, Go I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tyler. Well, I was just going to ask, in the prior slide, you said that they could share documents. Yes. I have never been able to make that work. Okay. So let me create one here, and I'll connect to, is anyone else logged into Hangouts? I'll, I'll use Kirk Stevens as my guinea pig here. Okay. So I'm going to do a call here. I'm going to create a Hangout. I'm going to start a Hangout. I'm going to call it Google Test. I, I, while you're doing yeah. that, I was going to say, I love Hangouts. And back to Serena, your question, if you come at that from a different angle, um, I, I use this all the time with students. And nobody, if you're chatting with, if you and I are in a Google Hangout, no one else could enter that room without you knowing it. So if, if a third party came into the conversation, it's going to pop up on your screen immediately and say, so-and-so joined the conversation. Right. So, so from that angle, you do have that kind of privacy. Right. Right. Yeah, the, the, the Google Hangouts is secure. We're, we're using Google Apps for education, so it's secured in that fashion, and then you're controlling access to it. So it's not open to the public. Not everyone can get there unless they were to share this link with someone else, and I guess someone else could come in. But, but you're going to see, see but you see who's in there. So let's just show. So right now I created this Hangout, and it's telling me I'm the only one in here. So I'm going to go to Invite People, and I'm going to type. I'll, I'll do a couple of people. Tyler, did you say you're logged in as well? And I'm going to invite both of them. What they're going to do is they're going to get an email that says, you've been invited to this Google Hangout. Then I'm going to let them join it, and you can see as they, they go in. And I'm going to turn off my video feed on it, just showing you that you don't need it. That's called a feedback loop. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with doing it in the same room. So if you guys, if you guys can mute your microphones. I'm muting everything. This one. Okay. All right. Feedback loop is gone. Okay. That's good. <laughs> All right, so now I can see in my Hangout that I've got Kirk in there and Tyler. If they don't want me to see their picture, you can go into the little settings. Um, we can turn things on and off here, and then I can go in and um, adjust the different things in the menu here. If I want to change how they see me, I can, um, I can make them a profile picture and things of that nature. So the short of it is you can control whether you're using video or audio. If you want to share a document that's on here, let's see. Where's the share? Kurt, can you can you share a document on yours? Because I want them to see what the re recipient is seeing on this end. Let's see. This is the tap dance to. Oh, what have I clicked on? So if I go to screen share, I can go in and and share different uh, screens that I've got on my uh, on my computer. So if I, for example, if I'm in Word, I can't really share that through Google Drive. Let me just do this. Let me open up Word. Okay, so I have this Word document open on my computer and I want to share that with everyone that's in there. I can go to the screen share. Where'd it go? 
and I can go to the application window tab and I can say, hey, only share this document. So now it brings it up to the front on mine. And if you guys, I don't know if you can see Tyler and Kirk's computers, but if they have the Google Hangout app, they should be seeing this Word document also. Tyler, can you hold your laptop up and prove that it's actually <laughs> showing that? So, so now we're collaborating, or they're seeing this document. We're not collaborating on it, but they're, they're, they're seeing this document. But that's done through the screen share. Um, let's see. I'm going to click on stop sharing. So they'll stop seeing that. There's a way to force the Google, a Google document in there, but I, I just don't see it in the immediate menus here. So, Tyler, is that your question to share a Google document through this? Well, my question was you can't actually send it like you would through Google Drive. Correct. Okay. Yeah, you're not, okay. yeah, correct. You're not sending them the actual document through Google Drive. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, you have to. Yeah, you have to actually invite someone, and then the, the screen share menu, and these will come up. Yeah, and there's a group chat over here on the right. I turned that on just so you can see it. Uh oh, Tyler left. That's okay. All right. Then at any point, you can end uh, the Google Hangout this way. So, uh, most people that use the the Google Hangouts use them for their office hours, but also for targeted meetings with students doing one-on-ones. When I taught online classes, it was invaluable to be able to, you know, help a student troubleshoot or show them how to do something when I can share my screen or have them share theirs and we can work hands-on collaboratively um, to do that. That makes it a lot easier. For those of you like teaching a foreign language or something else, you can go and you can actually see them and hear them speaking, uh, which is nice. You can't do that just through uh, written text. Um, so that's a nice application. And, and, and those are relatively permanent now. That, that's something with the latest version. Because like I created a hangout called like Kirk's Virtual Office. Mm -hmm. And then you save that URL. I just bookmark it. And like you said, I can put it in my syllabus or anything. Right. And, and just remember that when you go back, you're the first person there. It'll say, like, you're in the hangout, but nobody's joined the call yet. Right. So you have to join first, and then, and then you can see the other people. Yeah, what's nice about what Kirk's saying is when you create a hangout, it basically is creating a permanent link right. for that hangout. And you can have you can have one that's static and you can give it your name. So you could right. call it Kirk Kirk's office. And that and that link right there, I don't know if you can see it, but it would be hangouts.google.com, southwestern cc slash then whatever you name the hangout. And that will be persistent. So it's kind of a first come, first serve to grab that name right. um, as well. So it's pretty cool. All right. Any other questions on Hangouts? And if there's any particular thing that you want to do with Hangouts that I'm not covering, we can obviously, um, I can sit down with you and we can, we can hammer that out. So Tyler, if there's some application you need that to work on, just let me know and we can sit down and figure that out. Okay. The next one is Gmail. A little bit about Gmail. I know we, we all use Gmail and we're pretty familiar with it. But it's so extremely powerful. Um, and a way to keep things organized for you. I, I, I feel like I need to talk about a couple things each time I look at Gmail. Um, so a couple things I want to have you look at are one, are the layout of your Gmail. Gmail gives you dozens of ways to control your layout. How I do it, it may not be how you like it, uh, but you are in control of how it looks. So if you don't like how it looks on your screen, you can go in and fix it is the bottom line for that. Um, we'll talk about labels a little bit and I'll, I have a video for that. Um, and we'll talk about rules and then some different uh, some um, different views that you have in there. So for me, in my Gmail, I prefer this particular layout. And this may be a carryover from my Outlook days, which I love Outlook now. Um, but I, do, I did like their layout where you have what Outlook called folders over on the left um, side. And then you basically had a, a preview of your email list. Or not a preview, but a... a, a a list of all the emails. Then on the next is a is a preview pane of sorts. So that, yeah. Header view, that's called. what's it called? The header. The header view. Yes. So this is how I like to do it. But you may want it to look a different way. That's when you know you're in control of that. And there's a couple of different um, ways you can uh, tweak it. Up at the top on the menu, there's a way where you can tell it. I don't I don't want any split on my screens. On a vertical split, a horizontal split. I can click on the, the settings cog up here and I can go in and change my display density. I have it on compact, but they have a different one called comfortable. 
And those seem very subjective terms. <laughs> There's cozy. I like compact. The compact squeezes it in a little bit more. And then depending on how you have your Zoom set, um, if you're using Google Chrome, and I think this works for all the other browsers, on Windows is it, it's Control. On Mac, it's the Command key. So if I do Command plus or minus, I can adjust my zooming so I can control how big or small things are. So I know everyone in the room has different, uh, different eye levels. As my vision diminished when I turned 40 and had to start wearing glasses, I'm like, I need things bigger on my screen because I can't see them. Or I've got to be like this so I can see it. For those of you listening, that was my face close to the monitor. Um, so you can adjust the zoom, that'll impact how things look. You can change the colors. There's all sorts of things you can do. So just know that you can go dig into the settings and then you can go into the uh, settings menu and tweak some things that we'll look at. If you want to change the colors under the settings, you can go to themes and there's a whole bunch of themes set up. So if you want to use basic colors, all kinds of things, you can do that. You can make it your own photos and things of that nature. So just know that you're not limited to what you can put in there. So any questions on that? Some people don't like the preview pane. I like it. Some people want to double click on a message and then it comes up because they want to see things differently. Everyone's different, but we're all using the same thing, which is all I can ask. Okay? So yes? Can you change whether or not it continues the thread? Whether or not it does what? Yes. It, like continues conversation. A thread. Yes, that's the conversation view. So I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, the pros and cons of it. Yeah. So let's talk first about labels. Okay? So... If you are an old Outlook user, you remember things were in folders, okay? Uh, Gmail uses a thing called labels. And labels, at first I was resistant to labels, and once I got to understand them, they're the best thing that's ever been used. If you think of labels as sticky notes, okay? And I'm gonna show you a short video on this to kind of use your visual representation, but every time a message comes in to your Gmail, it comes into, all messages come into what's called all mail, which is all of your messages. Anything that's new, gets a label or a sticky note on it called inbox. That's why it shows up on the inbox over here as a message, okay? Once you're done with it, looking at it, you can archive it. By default, all archiving does is it means remove the inbox sticky note or label and just leave it in my all mail. I don't want to see it if I'm in my inbox, okay? However, you can add custom labels and you can add more than one label to, to a message, which is beautiful. So if I have a message that comes in from Jonathan that's something about IT, but it's also something that I need to do with, with the business office, I can add the label IT and business office and Jonathan Dean to it. And then I can find it in any one of those fashions. I can go into that label or that, or some people will call it folder, and I can find that message in there. Does that make sense? You can set up rules that when messages come in, that it automatically applies labels to your messages. So I have a rule set up that if I get an email from Kirk Stevens, it creates a label called Kirk Stevens and puts it on that message. Okay? Once I archive it, it goes out of my inbox and I know I can find it in his label. Okay? Everybody feel good about that? That's like the, uh, the main concept of it. Let me show you uh, a short video. It's like a minute and 40 seconds. track of all your messages and where they end up can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Understanding a few Gmail basics can help you find messages quickly and keep your account organized the way you want it. Gmail organizes a lot of your mail for you using labels. New messages are labeled inbox. And within your inbox, Gmail sorts your messages into categories like social, promotions, and updates. Messages you send are labeled as sent mail. If there are messages you don't want to keep, you can put them in the trash. Gmail keeps your deleted messages for 30 days and then gets rid of them for good. Junk mail is put in spam and each message is deleted 30 days after that. If you want to clean up your inbox but there's a chance you'll need a message later, archive the message. You can also organize your messages using custom labels or filters which can make it easier for you to find them. Each message can have more than one label, so you can look for your message in multiple ways. You can find all your messages in one of the labels listed on the left side of Gmail or using search. 
If you think a message you're looking for may have ended up in spam or trash, use advanced search to include spam and trash in your search. So now that you know how messages are labeled and where they go, you can keep tabs on all your email. Okay. That's a good, that's a feel good video about Gmail. Okay. So in a perfect world, there's a, there's a, there's a, a theory called inbox zero to where you should never have any messages in your inbox. So I have some in mine. I have 30 messages in mine, which is about, about my nervous point. About 25 or 30, I'm getting nervous that I really need to do something about it. But I know some people that have 8,000 messages in their inbox, which causes me some pain, but that's just how they organize their life, and it's fine. Um, but I, I think, just like when you're thinking about it as your desk, if you have an inbox and you have this huge stack, it's hard to really find stuff. So you need to handle and do something with it. And that's easier to say than in practice. Because as recently as a week ago, I had 67 messages in my inbox just because I was piled up trying to do stuff. So you really got to go in and handle them. Um, but you can go in and, um, and, and archive stuff. And you can come up with your own organization scheme um, that you want. So I'm not going to go into all the details of how to create labels and filters, but you can do that under the settings menu. I can go into uh, the settings and I can go to the labels tab and I can go down and I can create labels. If I scroll down to the very bottom, I can go down, actually it's at the top. I can go in and create new labels or I can do it on the fly. The easiest part is probably to do it on the fly. So I'm gonna find one, let's see, this message here. So this is actually from a different Scott Baker that's our architect with LS3P that's helping us with some of our new buildings. So let's say I need to create a label for messages that come from him. With a message from him open, I can use the little pull down here in the top right hand corner of the message. I can click on filter messages like this. And by default, it's gonna show who it's from. Now don't, use, don't do this if it's a message that goes to everyone in the college because it'll, it'll confuse the filters because it's from a distribution list. Do it from one that's actually from that person, not to a whole distribution list. So by default it's from, but I can set other parameters to set this filter up if I wanted to. But I'm just gonna say it's from Scott Baker to LS3P. Then I'm gonna click on create a filter with this search, okay? Then here's the cool part, here's where the magic happens. I can say apply a label and I can go to choose label. If I, if I don't already have it created, I can click on new label and so let's call this LS3P. And by default, it's going to put it in the top label of my folders. But let's say I want to nest this under my IT, IT label already. I can do nest under it, and it says select a parent. So I'll go down and select my IT folder, and I'll hit create. And then the magical part is, part two, also apply to 46 matching conversations. So emails that I've already gotten from him, I want to go in and apply this label to, so I don't have to go back and find all those and apply that label. So I'll click Create Filter, and it's going to do that. Here's a place where if you get, like, if you subscribe to a website, and they send you, they're constantly sending you updates, you can also do Skip the Inbox, Mark as Red. You know, you can do all sorts of stuff with it. So if you don't like emails from Scott, you can just skip the inbox and mark as read and you'll never see them, but they'll be in my label or in the all mail if you wanted to. So you can really control it. You can delete it by default if someone's bothering you and, and uh, you don't want to see those emails, you can do that. So I'm going to create that filter. And then now if I scroll down on the left-hand side under my labels that I have displaying, under my IT I have one called LS3P, and I can see now all the messages from Scott Baker at LS3P and I can find them all easily, rather than having to go up here and go in the search box and go find messages from Scott Baker at LS3P is even on my list. LS3P, oops, there he is. Instead of having to go here and search them and then try to find all the messages manually, I can go and do it pretty quickly. Okay, does everybody feel good about labels? Yes. Yeah, so, so once they come... What I go in and do is like, I'll just do a search. 
and I have to do this a couple of times a day because a lot of messages come in mm -hmm. that I want to maybe later look at and go through, but I want them out of my inbox. Yeah, so what you do is, now that's a good example of one, that even though it's coming from a listserv, if you can create a filter for that one, I, the reason I said it for here at the college is like, it would show it's coming from Kirk Stevens, mm -hmm. but the actual, the from is everyone at. And then you'd be creating a rule for everyone. But one that's coming from a listserv is coming from that listserv email address. <coughs> so just with that message in your inbox, create a filter, have it skip the inbox, but don't have it marked as red. And then over here on the left, you'll see just, I'll use the spam as an example. You'll see that there's 14 unread messages in your listserv label. And then you can just go back and look at them when you want, but they're, they're, bypassing your inbox as long as you check that box that says skip the inbox okay so that'll help you manage that there's a way to create multiple uh, inboxes if you want to um, one thing that i do want to tell you about is there was a question about conversation view versus not i used to loathe the conversation view because i would feel like i missed messages and what the conversation view is is if we have an email exchange so let's say peter and i are emailing back and forth and we bring a net in and then we're going back and forth, and also so that Lisa's in there and Aaron. If, by default, if I don't have conversation view, every one of those emails is a separate, independent message in my inbox. So if I'm trying to find one of them, now I've got to kind of dig through and look at them. What conversation view does is it will nest all the emails. Typically what it does is it looks at the subject line and all the ones that are messages that are replies or replies to all. And it will nest those together. So I can go in and look, so let me find one. I know I had one this morning about one of the classrooms. So I'm going to my IT folder and let's see. Here's one for example. So now the conversation view now stacks all these messages together so I can see them, so I can get to any particular message that's in that chain of emails and it keeps them all aggregated, okay? So I used to not like that because I felt like I missed, missed messages, but then it became more of a pain to find messages. One of the things that using Conversation View allows you to do is what's called the Send and Archive feature. And this is one you can turn on in the settings. But let's say I need to reply to this email. I'm gonna do a reply to all, which remember goes to everyone. Now I'm not gonna actually send this. But what it does is it gives me this button now called Send an Archive. I've got Send and Send an Archive. If I just hit Send, it would send to those people, but it would leave the message in my inbox. If I do the Send an Archive, it sends the message, and then it archives the message based on whatever rules I have set up, or if there's no rules, it just goes to all mail. So then, it, then I reply to the message, and it gets it out of my inbox all in one swoop. So that only works if you have Conversation View enabled. And to enable Conversation View in your settings, under the general tab, there is conversation view and you have to turn conversation view on for that to work. Okay? Can you show how to uh, set up the send and archive? Okay. Right beneath conversation view is send an archive and you click show send an archive button and reply. And then I think actually you have to turn it on now, there used to be a Google Lab, but I guess it's not now. Apparently, that's a built-in feature. I've been using it for so long. It used to be a Google Labs, but now it's apparently it's built into Gmail. So you just do, yeah, under the regular settings, you turn Conversation View on, then click Show Send an Archive button and reply. Okay. It's based on your archive rule. If you don't have any archive rule set up, if you don't have a label that's automatically applied to that message, you need to apply a label to it, or it just takes it out of the inbox and leaves it in all mail, okay? Now, if you don't have a rule set up for labels, I'm gonna come back in here in just a second. If I have a label set up, you can click and drag a label to a message and it applies the label to it. When I click on a message, I can see at the top all the labels that are applied. If I do one by accident, I can click on the little X that's by it and remove the label. So you can click and drag the label to the message. And Outlook you used to would drag the message to the folder, but don't, it won't let you do that. You have to drag the label to the message. Okay? All right, so let's go back into the settings and I'll talk about a couple other things. One thing I encourage you to turn on is the undo send. Okay? Yeah, save, save yourself some heartache, especially if you have to hit reply to all. Use your chance to recover. Um, and you can set it for up to, I think, a minute maybe. Let's see. 
30 seconds. So 5, 10, 20, or 30 seconds. I found 20 is about my happy medium. I need a <laughs> so what that does is when I send a message, I'm going to do one here real quick. So let's say I meant to put one, two, three, four, and I hit send. And right as I hit send, remember this is like when you used to lock your keys in your car. Right when you shut it, like, oh man. Now it'll say up here, this message has been sent. Undo. Okay? It's not actually sent. It's just telling me. So if I yeah, it's in the hopper, but it's not going yet. If I click on undo, now I've got the message back and I can edit it. However, once the undo send time expires, it's sent. It's not like in the old days when we had group rise where you could actually claw it back. It's gone. So once it actually sends, it has sent, and there's no retraction other than you sending the apology email immediately following that. <laughs> okay. is, there, is there a formula for that, of the apology? Uh, no. There is a lab called Google Goggles that allows you, you can say, hey, between midnight and 4 a.m., don't oh, okay. let me send any emails without having to do this math problem. Right. So, so if you're inebriated and you, and you tend to te send emails at all hours, you can kind of set up a safeguard for yourself. Which is nice. So that's that might be that might be useful for you. Uh, but anyway, I encourage you to do the undo send. The caveat with that is is if Kirk's expecting that email and I hit send and we're on the phone, I send it. He's like, I haven't gotten it yet. That's because your undo send timer is counting down. So until it ends, he's not going to actually get that message. Okay. So everybody feel good about that one. All right. A couple other things. I know. So we're, we're officially at the one hour mark. So if anyone needs to go, feel free. I'm just going to press on and, and keep going because I, I think we have some cool stuff um, to look at here. So if you need to leave, then by all means, my feelings are not hurt. Um, some other Google Apps, things that are helpful. We talked about Undo Send. At the preview pane, which I showed you, we talked about Conversation View. You can turn on the right side chat, um, um, which I like putting, the, putting it over there. Again, go to the Settings. Go over to the Labs tab. And here's where you have a whole laundry list of cool Google Labs things. And they're, they're grouped by the ones that are enabled at, their, at the top, and then they're in alphanumeric order. So starting it down here are ones I haven't used. Okay? But one of them is called Right Side Chat. If you enable that, it puts the chat over here on the right-hand side, which is nice. Ones that I have turned on in here are um, verified senders. I have canned responses, which is pretty cool. If you have emails that you send out a lot, you can pre-type in canned responses and subject lines and save those. Then you can just insert a canned response and it brings up that template for you and you just type stuff in, which is very useful. I use that a lot for students. Yeah, when you're, yeah, it's, it's great for instruction or if there's things that you send out a lot that's the same, but you may edit one little part of it. That's really useful. Um, um, sir, can you say that again? Because um, one of the things, in if anybody wants to see an organized inbox, I still have cat rooms that uses labels and colors and the only it's, thing that saves us. Yeah. But the one thing that she did that helped, and maybe this is what you're talking about, she has saved something like, uh, it's a phenomenal number, like 150 draft emails, and that's what she was doing. It was stuff that she just copy pasted when she had canned responses yeah. she had to send. Is that what you're saying? That, mm -hmm. that that was useful, but there's a better way to do it? Yeah. Okay. So I can go in here. So let's, let's say. And this is just an example. Oops. Okay. So, and then I know I need to edit this fill in the blank. Yeah. So once I fill this out, I can go down here in the bottom next to the trash can, and I can go to canned responses, and I can save okay. um, ones that I have, and I can insert ones that I have. So I'll just go to one that I have built in. So I had one when I was dean called Core Surveys, and I would just, I would always send that out, so I could just have it put that in there. Okay. okay? So it's very handy. So you can type what you want in there, and you can save it, canned response, and you can insert they are it. In. Saved in the drafts folder. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where you're seeing them okay. is okay. in the drafts folder. All those canned responses that are set up. Okay. Once you once I start one, um, if I delete this, that draft goes away. That the canned responses, the text that's in them is just saved within Gmail. So she may have just had a bunch of drafts that she went ahead and built, but just had them had sent yet. I bet that's what Kathleen was doing is if you see a whole bunch of drafts in there. there there's a funny little glitch with that because okay. if, when your canned responses, when you're in here, you don't see them in your drafts folder. Right. 
but if you go to your phone, you'll see you're, you're or a different device. Right, you'll, you'll see how it's saved. Particularly the mobile, you'll see can you'll see a bunch of graphs, and you're like, what are those? Because one time I accidentally deleted them. I, I saw them on the phone, and I was like, I don't have any graphs. And I deleted all those graphs, and when I went back to my computer, I lost all my canned responses. Yeah, that's a good point. So in Gmail on the computer, its drafts is basically filtering those canned responses yes, I, out. But on your mobile device, you may see those. So don't delete your canned responses. So I have the preview pane turned on, quote selected text, and right side chat. But there's a whole bunch of ones that are in there that are pretty cool. Um, if you want the multiple inboxes some people like that and that allows you to create rules for multiple inboxes it's pretty cool um, so you can do you can just play with those I encourage you to do that um, we talked about sending archive and canned responses and multiple inboxes I could show you that if you want to see it or I can show you afterwards if you want to but it allows you I can create a rule that says if there's an email like I could do one called you know emails from Dr. Thomas and it's always going to show all those at the top every how many I do above my inbox. So I can create multiple inboxes to do that. So it'll let you, it'll let you go in and do that as well. Um, one of the things that some people find annoying in Gmail by default are kind of this primary social updates thing. If you don't like those, you can turn them off. I get rid of the one called promotions, but the social one is anything that kind of comes in like from YouTube or, or that sort of thing. By default, will get put in there. The updates are like Google Calendar invites and things of that nature will drop in there by default. But if you don't like those, you can simply go in here to the configure inbox and you can turn those off. And it's just gonna drop everything into the primary inbox um, that's in there. So notice my inbox count went up to 39 because I had some stuff in those, in those other tabs. Now you're really yeah, now I'm sweating bullets, people. <laughs> So I'm going to turn those back on. And then it brings my inbox back. I'm at 31. People keep, it keeps pouring in if you could only clamp it off, right? So any questions on any of the, the Google Labs utilities? Just go in there and play with it. You're not going to break anything, I promise. Okay? So let's talk about something. I'm going to give Kirk Stevens credit for this, even though, even though uh, I'm a veteran and some of you in the room may be as well, are looking at doing some the military precision with, with, with emails. And so Kirk shared this with me and that's something that I've been trying to do the last couple of weeks, which is very cool, is that in your subject line of your messages, if you will preface what you see in bold here, and I'll share the link to the website that kind of gives the, the, the why on this, but if you will add this keyword at the beginning of each of your subject lines, so you could put like action, colon, and then what you would do is the subject line, and then look at this set of rules that applies to say, hey, Here's what needs to, what I want to happen. So Kirk will send me something, he'll say info. And I know that he's not expecting a reply, he's just giving me that information. But if I need to, if I need to act, he'll put in there action or sign or decision or request or coordination. So I know now I need to take action on this email. So, so I challenge you for a week to try that. That's great. And then the cool part about it is, is you can create rules. And I create labels called action. Coordination, and I say, and I set up a rule that says, when I get an email that has action in it, apply that label to it, and then I can find all my emails that are my action items in here that I need to take care of. Okay, so you can go in and do that. I encourage you to give it a try. Again, I'll share the web page that has some more information on this, but it's a pretty cool way, and this is the way the military does it, so that you know things are concise and to the point, and you know what you need to do. Okay, and, and promise me you'll never see an email without at least a subject line. <laughs> Because the subject line will be no subject line. It's like this page is intentionally left blank. No, it's not. There's something on it. Um, the bottom one, which is the bluff, which is the bottom line up front, and the message body, you can start it with B-L-U-F colon and what the bottom line is. And then you can give us the brief rationale after it. Okay? So people just want to tell me just the facts. Start with the bottom line up front. And then I can choose to read any more if I want to hear the rationale. But the gist of it is, this is what's happening. And this is what we're doing moving forward. Okay? Everybody feel good? So I challenge you to do the, the military precision uh, test. And if you like it, I appreciate that. If you hate it, Kirk Stevens is the one that started it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've already done a pretty good demonstration of Gmail. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Google Docs. There was one of the comments on the survey that said, if I'm working in Google Docs, 
how can I make sure that I don't mess up things that are in it? So I wanna, I'll, I'll, brief, I'll speak briefly about that. Uh, but basically Google Docs is the, uh, the Google version of the Microsoft Office application. Docs is Word, Sheets is Excel, um, uh, presentations, uh, is it slides now, I need to update this, is PowerPoint. And then you have forms and drawings, which Office doesn't have. So I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip that video. Actually, I should probably show it. No, I'm not going to. I'll jump back and forth. Peter, Peter appreciates my manic uh, effort on that. Uh, was that a decision? Yeah, that was a quick decision. So what you've got basically are uh, different versions of, of online versions of Microsoft Office. When I use these, and when I would encourage you to use them, like we discussed earlier on, is when you need to have a collaboration happen, or you want to always be available in the cloud or in, and or to edit anywhere you want to go. Okay. Otherwise, I'm not going to preclude you from using Microsoft Office files at all. I mean, I use them for, for most of what I do. But where it's really handy is if you need to collaborate. So I'm going to show you a quick exercise that if we all needed to edit the same thing, how easy it is, rather than me creating, I'm going to create a Google Sheet and I'll share it with all of you in the, that, have, that have RSVP'd and show you how easy that is. If I did this in Excel and I put it on the W drive, only one of us could edit it at a time. I have to tell you where it all is and then then we'd have to figure out who's going to edit it and when, okay? So bear with me while I show you this. So I'm going to go to new and create a Google Sheet. It's in my Google Palooza Part 4 folder. Okay. So it creates the sheet, and I'm going to call this one Share Test, okay? And I'm, all I'm going to do is give it a name. I'm going to go into the list of everyone that has rsvp for the event, which is all this email list. I'm going to copy it. And I could just do this one person at a time, but just I want to show you this. This is pretty cool. I'm going to go up to share in the top right hand corner. Right now, only I have access to it. Here I can put in names and addresses. For example, if I want to share this with Dr. Thomas, I could type in his name and add a note and I could share it with him. But let's say I want to share it with a bunch of people at once. If I have any, a group set up in my contacts and my email, I could just type that group name in here. And it would let me share them with all of them at once. Or if I've copied all those email addresses, I can just paste it. And it goes and resolves all those email addresses with everyone here at the college. And then I'm going to hit send. And I left the checkbox and notify people. I can also go to the, event, the menu up here and say, hey, I want to let you edit or just comment or just be able to view on it. If you remember from that video, I'm going to let you all have edit rights on it. And I'm going to hit send. And it says shared with 23 people. Now, if you're logged into your Gmail, you should have a message now in your Gmail that says, Scott has shared this document with you. And the cool part about it is look up here on the screen at the top and you should see this on yours. It'll start showing everybody that's now connected to this sheet. Okay. And now which is beautiful and which also could be catastrophic, is now everyone has editing privileges to the same document. So everybody go in and just type something somewhere in this spreadsheet, just so I can show you which may answer a question that someone had in one of the comments that they wanted to see. Okay, so now I see it's, right now we're in the Wild West. Obviously if you were sharing something, you would have some organization to it and you'd have people fill this in. So Jonathan Dean would never do this or you just share let people edit it randomly. You'd have everything set up and you know where you're supposed to fill in fields. Okay? So everybody stop typing for a minute. So let's say I see that my document has now been screwed up and I need to get back to where I was. Like look at A1. I type my name in A1. Yeah. Somebody type yeah, someone typed right over to me, right over the top of him. I mean, that's just weird. <laughs> so under the file menu, the beauty is you can go, and this applies to all Google Docs, I can go to see revision history and I can go in and I can see today at 10.14, people made all these changes. I'm like, I want to go back to the clean version. I'm going to restore this version. And voila, I've basically gone like time machine back in time and I've restored it to that version that it was. So if someone actually deletes something, messes something up, that lets you go back and, and go back in time. Now, if you have a whole bunch of people editing at the same moment, just like we did, I can't just pick and choose which ones to undo. I just roll back in time. But what's cool is that over a series of hours and days, you've got this entire history that saves for the, the lifetime of the, of the file. So that applies to Google Docs, Google Sheets, 
any of those. It works. Can you go back now? Do what? Can you undo that? Yeah, so I can go to revision history. I'm like, you know what? I'm good with that. I just want to restore that. Everyone's back in. Okay? And one, one second, Aaron. And the cool thing, too, on the revision history is it color codes who did what. So if I go to this one, notice the colors match with which cell that they edited. So if someone messes something up, you can, aha, I see who did that, and I'm going to go in and fix it. Okay? Oh, one, one at a time. So Aaron, you had your hand up first. Right. Um, and you don't want to overwrite or change anything on this file, but you need your own copy and you want to revise it. You can even share a copy. If you make the copy of the file right now, mm -hmm. you'll have an exact copy, right. which you then own and you can share at your will right. with other folks. But that, I mean, sometimes you might get something from a colleague that, you know, it's a, it's a blank file. Use this for all your whatever needs. And if you make a copy, then it's owned by you. Right. Because your changes don't necessarily affect then right. whatever they've done. Yeah, so the comment is basically I can go in now in my Google Drive and I can make a copy of that file. Then it's just mine that I can control and then the, the shared one goes back to everyone else. Question, yes. Um, I've completed um, some where I've been told where, you know, several people are putting in information, but if someone has it open, Nobody else can get in it, so that kind of prevents people putting in and the information in all at the same time. So is, can you set it that way? Or? You can set permissions for people. Some people can edit, some people can only view. Are you talking, is that what you're but saying? Not to have it open at the same time. Um, like somebody went in, the, in the office would have left it open. And so nobody else could open it up. At yeah, that time. yeah, so that doesn't apply to any of the Google Sheets and Docs. That was probably an office. That was probably like on the W Drive. Someone had a spreadsheet open. They opened it, left for the day, and then you can't edit it. Mm -hmm. So that's where Google Sheets, Google, the Google Docs, is really advantageous because that can't happen. Unless the owner then removes editing privileges for someone, leaves it open. Okay? There are some other questions, right? Kirk, were you going to say something? I was going to say, with what Aaron said, and one of the comments from the people who filled out your survey was about making sure you don't change somebody else's document. And I did that this week. You shared a file with me, and I dragged it over to my stuff, and I started editing it. And then I realized I was editing your original. I forgot to make a copy of it. So I would be only editing my copy. Yeah, that's so a good point. That exact thing. Yeah, so that's a good point. Yeah, if someone shares with you and you want to have your own copy to do stuff with, just create a copy of it. Okay? Now, one part where we talked about the sharing is, one thing I don't like about Google Drive is that you have your My Drive, but when someone shares stuff with you, there's this uh, kind of nebulous shared with me that's kind of like shared in the order that, that they've been shared. So you might have to find it there, but if it's something that you want to keep, you can go to and expand your My Drive, and you can drag it from Shared With Me over to your drive, and it's gonna sync and keep it in there for you. So then you don't have to go into the Shared With Me and try to, to suss it out. And then you can delete it from Shared Yeah, then you can, remove it. Yeah, you can remove it from Shared With Me, and it doesn't delete the original, it just makes it so that I no longer see it in my Shared With Me folder. Okay, so you can keep that, you can keep that clean if you want to. Maybe that's the Shared With Me zero method, is keeping your Shared With Me clean, okay? All right, so that's pretty much all of the items that I wanted to cover with the presentation. I appreciate everyone staying a little bit longer. Oops. I'll share that video, Peter, because now I know you want to see it. Okay, we, we, didn't, we didn't get into Google Calendar, and someone had a question about how do I share my calendar. So let me show you that real quick. So, Sorry, I'm being manic again. I'm, I'm jumping around. So if, you, if there's people that you need to be able to see your calendar, or you can create a separate calendar if you need to, but by default... On your calendar itself, you can use this pull-down menu and go into your settings. And then for your calendar up here, you can go to edit and you can say, I want to share my calendar with this particular person. And then you can control, let's say, let's say I keep using Kirk as my example. 
I can say, for my account, for Kirk, I want him to be able to only see if I'm busy or free. I don't even have the details of what I'm doing. I just want him to see if I'm blocked off or see all details, or I can give them the ability to, to make changes. So if you have an administrative assistant or someone that you want to be able to edit your calendar, when I was career tech dean, I gave Claudia edit rights to my calendar because if someone needed to make an appointment, she could then go in and put them on my calendar and I would have it, okay? So um, you can let someone else manage and share or change your event or just see what's on there or just see if you're free or busy. So that allows them to share your calendar. Now let's say you have, um, you want to create a different calendar. You can do that. Um, you can create a separate calendar. If you don't want to be your actual college calendar, you can do that as well. Don't we, don't we by default, we can see everyone's calendar anyway? Um, type in no, my name. Except you have to Search for other calendars down there. Yeah. Search type in my name. So here's add a co-worker's calendar. Kirk Stevens. You can see my calendar. Yeah, let's see. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, and that's it. So if Kirk does, if he does, all you can see is I'm busy. Right. I guess so. Yeah. Is it? Are you this one? I'm dark blue. No, it's red. No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm red. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, it's this one. Yeah. So you can see if you want to add someone's calendar, but if if you don't want other people to be able to see your calendars. Let me remove that. Let's see. If you don't want people to be able to see, do that, you can go into your settings and to your shared edit settings. And by default, up here at the top on the share calendar with others, there's the checkbox that says share this calendar with everyone at SCC. And then you can only show free, busy, or see all event. Or you can uncheck that. I can tell you Lisa likes it for when they're trying to set up things and they're trying to see if everyone's available for a meeting or not. Um, so you can choose to share your calendar or not. I think by default that's turned off. I'm not sure. I, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you. Think by default it's turned on. Is it turned on? But it's only shows free. Busy. Free busy. Okay. That's yeah, that's a good point. So by default, yeah, other people can go and view your calendar. Where that's nice is if. I'm creating a calendar event. And I think one of the questions was, how do I create a calendar event and then go back and edit it? Someone had that. Well, actually what I was looking for was to put my part-time schedule mm -hmm. in my calendar so everybody could see while I'm not going to be working then. Yeah, so you could create a different calendar. You can create a new calendar called your part-time schedule mm -hmm. and then just put in recurring events for your part-time schedule then just share that third calendar, secondary calendar with people and they're not seeing your actual real calendar as well. Okay, so um, if I'm going to create an event, and let's say I'm going to do it today at 9 a.m., and I want to invite Kirk Stevens, if I can spell his name correctly, and then I click on Suggested Times, what that's going to tell me is Kirk's not available from 9 to 9.30, but he is available at 10, 10, 30, 11, because it's looking at his calendar to see when he's available, okay? So that's where the sharing is nice, is if you're trying to collaborate with some people that's on there, okay? All right, I've danced around the calendar a little bit. Does anyone else have any questions on calendar? All right, I encourage you, uh, whenever you create a calendar event or you're gonna have a meeting or anything, always invite all your participants, because then it sends them an invite to the calendar. They can immediately put it on their calendar when they click yes, I'm going, with all of the details you put on it. And then you see an RSVP list of everyone that's going to come to your event. Also, when you do a calendar invite, it, it gives the, the person who's being invited gets a little agenda view of their own schedule, so they don't even have to go to their calendar. Right. They can see it right in their email. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So I encourage you, everything that you do at college and whether you do it in your personal life is up to you, but everything that you have at the college, the stuff you need to block off time, put it on your calendar, um, and then you can share whatever details you want with others as you want. Scott, we've even uh, gone to scheduling drive time because sometimes we're off campus for things, mm -hmm. and because we are sharing calendars and have an agreement on what we want for each other, 
other. Right. Um, and there have been times that we get looked back to that. So we made an agreement that we, if, if I have to be in Macon at a certain time, mm -hmm. we go in and schedule that because I need to understand right. that meeting. But we schedule drive time and we mark it drive time. Yeah, There's mark your commute time. That's a good yeah, point. So, so it could look like I'm available from 9.30 to 10, but i got to be at Macon at 10. So yeah. 9.30 to 10 is my travel time. Yeah. And then 10 o'clock is my meeting. So you got that, it. that has helped us. Okay. <laughs> So you can do recurring events, it's pretty easy on there, and what have you, so, okay? I know a lot of instructors create for each of their courses, share a calendar for each one, some don't, um, so you can do that as well. But the beauty of calendar is it keeps everyone organized, and if I create an event and I'm inviting all of you to it, rather than an email saying, hey, let's meet tomorrow at five, what if I create a calendar invite and I send it to you, and you just, all you had to do is click on yes, instead of each of you having to individually create that event on your calendar, and then where was it at again? I gotta go back and look at my email. As the organizer, I put all that in there. You can upload documents to the to the calendar event. You can put in details in the description. You can put web links in there that are reminders. So it's really dynamic what you can do with calendars. Okay. All right. I appreciate everyone staying the extra 30 minutes for Google Palooza. If you have any other questions, I'm glad to uh, hang around and answer those if you like. But I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Thank you.